This mound of rubble in Mozimbao de Praia, in extreme north of Mozambique, was once a mosque. It was demolished by the government after an attack in October, attributed to a group of young men who are believed to have frequented it. The police in Mozambique say at least 10 people were beheaded in an attack in the northern part of the country over the last weekend. The attacks, it says, occurred at Olumbi village near the town of Palma, close to Mozambique's border with uh, Tanzania and uh, near one of the world's biggest untapped offshore gas fields. Militias have been raiding villages and government buildings for the past three years. Mozambique's government says fighters affiliated to ISIL are operating in parts of Cabo Delgado province. It's the early morning of October 5th, 2017, in a sleepy fishing village called Mosimbo de Praia in the Cabo Delgado province of northern Mozambique. A group of 30 armed Islamists, now known as Ansar al Suna launched an attack on the town, temporarily occupying it. By the end of the attack, it was reported that 16 people had been killed, including two police officers. Prior to the attack, locals had warned government officials that the Islamist group had established themselves in the area, taking over the local mosques where they preached a strict version of Islam and anti-state ideology. Since that initial attack, according to Human Rights Watch, Ansar al Sunnah have carried out more than 350 attacks, killing over 600 people and leaving over 115,000 displaced by the violence. There have been reports of massacres and beheadings. In response to the attacks, Mozambican security forces have been accused of human rights abuses in the province, including unlawful kills, intimidation of journalists who have been banned from covering the violence, and also the ill-treatment of detainees. Cabo Delgado is rich in natural resources. In 2009, a vast deposit of rubies was discovered in the region, and now it accounts for half the world's supply of the gemstone. The following year, there was an offshore discovery of one of the largest natural gas fields in Africa. But these discoveries have also been marred by corruption. This region is also a key smuggling area. Heroin arriving from South Asia for the markets in East and Southern Africa and Europe often makes land here before moving on elsewhere. It's also a key export point for ivory and other illegal wildlife products, as well as timber smuggling. And there are even unconfirmed reports that alleged arms are delivered there too. These illicit activities have been allowed to flourish in the north of Mozambique in full view of the authorities and local inhabitants. You're listening to Deep Dive, exploring organized crime from the Global Initiative Against Transnational Organized Crime. I'm Lindy Tongana. So how will the ongoing violent insurgency impact on the organized criminal networks that operate in the area? And what about the corruption within the Mozambican state? How has that contributed to the growth of the insurgency? Professor Adriano Novunga is the director of the Center for Democracy and Development and a leading civil society activist in Mozambique. Corruption in Mozambique is rampant. You have kind of systemic corruption. During my times at SIP, SIP is um, uh, Mozambique's chapter of Transparency International. We conducted a start aimed at estimating how deep corruption is, focusing on certain areas. And we concluded that it was so deep, its impact was around one quarter of Mozambique's GDP in 2013. Mozambique has um, a GDP at the time of around 20, 25 billion dollars. So you can have an idea of how big corruption is. More importantly, and in relation to the topic here, is the fact that the nature of Mozambique's corruption is that it takes away the state capacity it hampers the ability of the state to invest 
in people's development, to invest in uh, development, so to say, which result in discontent, not only in the urban areas, but also in the provinces and the rural areas where people don't see the state presence in the form of infrastructure and service. And that is because corruption is, is so deep and in a sense, it drives politics uh, in Mozambique. So Cabo Delgado is a region that's characterized by neglect and uh, discontent. But in your view, what are the key factors that make Cabo Delgado a ripe area for the birth of an insurgency? It is an area that was relatively neglected in terms of state presence and investment. It is an area also where it has served corridors of drug trafficking. I recall one of the first case of drug trafficking in this country, it was discovered in Cabo Delgado Shores. This was early in the 90s, so long time ago, giving an indication that it is something that has been there. But also, uh, Cabo Delgado being rich in natural resources, gold and ruby, most of which alluvial, with a relatively uh, weak state presence, it has attracted people from all over Africa to explore those opportunities around those alluvial resources in a form of artisanal mining. So you have a social fabric that is prone, is vulnerable to incitement, is vulnerable to being captured by illegal and other forms of criminal activities. This is more the social fabric of Cabo Delgado. Perhaps state intervention was slow when it mattered most, but right now, what is the government doing? What is at the center of their response? We have been calling for regional intervention. We have been calling for SADC and the African Union to intervene. And the argument is that what Mozambique is facing, although it is, it is driven by uh, local discontent, it is driven by internal dynamics, speaking to discontent on the one hand, and the lack of state capacity to address those grievances, but it was gradually being taken or being captured by Islamist groups, by groups either linked to or aiming at linking themselves to the Islamic State or other manifestations of this group. So although we have seen that, we have been saying that Mozambique needed to quickly get regional support. And the reason being that if Mozambique is unstable in that particular region, if Mozambique is unstable, the entire region will not be stable. Professor, what about the media? Are they being able to report on what's happening in Cabo Delgado? There is a, a, a worrisome line of violation of human rights. And that includes to the media being stopped from doing its job. The, the freedom of expression and uh, freedom of the press is being suppressed. Journalists are being targeted. Reporters are being abducted and not clear which side is abducting reporters and journalists. And that is fueling a whole climate of uncertainty, a whole climate of clearly a disorder. And to some extent, there is a disorder 
that is instrumentalized as a way of controlling what is happening. So the uh, what is being done with the media is aimed, in our view, to hamper the people of Mozambique region and the world to know what is happening. Do you think that government efforts to restore faith in the state would actually help end this insurgency? In other words, not going for a military solution, but actually addressing the root causes of discontent in the north of the country? At this point in time, it is difficult to say what the root causes are and what, um, what, what now are the factors that are perpetuating the insurgency. But as I've said, you have a social fabric in that area that it enabled for this situation to evolve until where we are today. So government needs to work with its partners, its developmental partners. There is COVID, but it's urgent to find ways of urgently intervening. Of course, there need to be a combination here. As it stands now, uh, I do understand the need for military intervention, but that needs to be followed or that needs to open the avenues, the corridors for a rapid humanitarian intervention and properly intervening at addressing the root causes of the discontent. Professor Adriano Novunga is the director of the Center for Democracy and Development and a leading civil society activist in Mozambique. When it comes to the illicit economy in Cabo Delgado, is there any evidence at the moment to suggest that the insurgents are already dabbling in the world of illicit trade, particularly now that they've seemed to come back better armed and somehow better funded? Simone Hasem is a senior analyst at the Global Initiative Against Transnational Organized Crime researching the role of foreign organized crime groups in Africa. We have concerns about the heroin trafficking routes to the region and also concerns about, the, about uh, really smuggling. For heroin, again, it's, we have no evidence and we, we consider it to be highly unlikely that the insurgents are able to play a large or controlling role in that industry or to establish their own links to suppliers in Pakistan. But they may have a certain amount of leverage over key coastal landing sites. And one of the ways that as an insurgent group, they would be able to derive money from the illicit economy would be simply through extortion, taxation or protection payments that they get from traffickers who want their business to run smoothly and don't want to be attacked, don't want to have their transport routes disrupted. It's possible, and there are reports that major heroin traffickers in some of the coastal towns may have been making those protection payments to the insurgents. We also think that the involvement of the insurgents in the Montepoix ruby fields requires more research. The group has quite a sort of established relationship with that part of the province, both in terms of some of the early sects were, were located around Montepoix. And it's believed that the expulsion of artisanal miners from the ruby mines in some way fed into the origins of the group, perhaps turning to violence. And more recently, there are also claims that rising violence again between artisanal miners and security forces there are in some way influenced by the insurgency. The trafficking routes through the region, most notably the fact that Dar es Salaam serves as both a gold and ruby market or gem market, and the insurgents links to southern Tanzania, which have also been established, would mean that they would have a regional route to, to laundering uh, rubies as a commodity. All of that to say with the disclaimer that we've highlighted these as, as risks and vulnerabilities that need monitoring. With a significantly long and porous coastline, what are the other centers of illicit trade and illicit trafficking in Mozambique? So the Global Initiative has previously identified several places further south as being important to the heroin economy, most notably Nakala Port, which is the deepest port along the eastern seaboard of Africa, and a site where um, there have allegedly been informal control of the town by a 
small set of business families who are very closely tied to the political elite and receive protection from them in order to run a number of trafficking businesses, heroin being perhaps the most lucrative, but also the smuggling of gray goods related to the same constellation of, of networks around the color. There are lots of what are called Bandari Bubu, so informal ports in small beaches and coves and small islands along the coast that create places where small, ships, small trafficking shipments can be offloaded and then consolidated elsewhere. Angoshe was somewhere that was highlighted to us as a place that had become more popular or popular once again as a landing site due to some disruptions that had happened as a result of the conflict in the north. And of course, if you go even further down, Bay Area was a massive center of illegal timber smuggling. There are multiple criminal economies in, in Mozambique, including further south. How deeply embedded are these activities within government? particularly the higher circles of power? I'm afraid that the, the evidence is that corruption is systemic in Mozambique, so present in all levels of government in ways that are mutually reinforcing and incredibly difficult to disrupt. So yeah, we, we, we identify Mozambique as, as a particularly fragile country, a particularly criminalized state in which there are really high, high risks of major trafficking phenomena developing, in which there are already several major trafficking networks operating, and where the local population has very little resilience or few levers to, to pull in, in order to, to reverse that situation. That was Simone Haysom, a senior analyst at the Global Initiative. In recent years, Mozambique has become ubiquitous with transnational organized crime. Its strategic geographical position on the east coast of Africa puts it at the axis of a variety of illicit trades. For example, the illegal wildlife trade, heroin trafficking, and human smuggling. Just when did Mozambique take up this position? Alistair Nelson is a senior analyst who coordinates the GI's Resilience Fund work in Mozambique. If we look at really at, at a start, we're probably looking at the late 90s, early 2000s in, in our knowledge. But the war economy before that probably gave a good opportunity for people to be smuggling goods in and out. You know, if we go back to those war years, there's the reported smuggling of, of the apartheid era government in South Africa, smuggling weapons into Gorongosa to fund Renama, smuggling weapons over the, the border of Kruger National Park to, to support Renama as well and then wildlife ivory rhino horn moving back. So already those sort of systems and networks that illicit trafficking was, was there from the 80s. And during that period as well, it, it looks like from what we can ascertain that people who had cash in places like Beira in Pember in the north played a role in the war economy of smuggling goods in that they could then sell on and make money from. And, and it seems that those people had the ready the cash available that, that as it as it moved out, they had the cash and connections. As the war ended and it moved out, they were able to start looking at, at illicit trades as well. What we understand from heroin trafficking in particular is that it goes right back to the late 90s, early 2000s. And heroin was brought in as, as the southern route was developing, so bringing drugs down into southern Africa to get them up to Europe. And in fact, the political protection was started to be provided at that time. It's quite an entrenched system. And actually, I could go further back because there's actually a history of smuggling on this coast that's 2,000 years old. And that really affects northern Mozambique in particular. That's really far back. And when you say it's entrenched, can you tell me more about the connections between trafficking and high-ranking officials within the Mozambique government? So the interesting thing, I think, is that it was entrenched at, at, at a high level with these high-level heroin traffickers from the early 2000s. And that's fairly well explained. And you know, the US had sanctions against one individual in particular in Maputo from about 2010. And there's a couple of other families in the further north um, of trading families who have also been named as, as some known heroin traffickers. And, and they seem connected to the, the very top of the parties. And it seems that also we see the sons and the families of some of the generals, their sons get access to some ruby concessions as well. You've got the, the trafficking side and then you've got this other side of, of people being able to access these concessions and so on in, in ways that appear relatively dubious, like it's not an open tender process, basically. So there seem to be some quite strong connections between uh, people who are well-connected in the party 
and both trafficking and some of the lucrative concessions that are available as well. What is the relationship between the insurgency and the illicit economy? So they're taking over these towns, they're looting the banks, stealing the money, taking food, handing out food to the local population, telling them not to support the government, that the government takes everything from them, and that they will come back and they're going to provide for people. So they're really trying to create this area of influence. Now what's key about that area of influence is that it's an area where heroin comes in on small boats, fishing boats, off the dows. So these dows come down the coast of Africa from Iran and, and Pakistan from the Makran coast with heroin from Afghanistan, comes down and, and small boats bring that heroin in to shore. And then it's trafficked from there, it's down to Nampula and northern Mozambique and onto South Africa. Mm-hmm. So there's heroin trafficking through there. There's also human smuggling. So one of the routes that, that migrants from Somalia, Ethiopia, and so on who want to make it down to South Africa, one of their routes is down the coast on Dows, and those Dows often dock into northern Mozambique in the fishing harbors at some of the Pride, Kasanga. And then those people are get onto buses and they sort of pay their way down and through. So there's another illicit trade there as well. There's timber trafficking as well, comes out of that area. What about the rubies? The world's um, largest ruby find at a place called Montepuez in Cabo Delgado. The concession has been given to a company which is, is headed by some of the sons of generals and, and Flimo officials. They have 25% of that concession. Gemfields from the UK has 75%. And the government has moved all the people who, who were originally from that area off that land, be they farmers, and a lot of people who were working as artisanal miners um, when the rubies were found. Of course, there'd been a huge influx of people from around the region as well, from Zimbabwe, from, from Tanzania. And in the early days, there were a lot of ruby buyers that had come over from Thailand and so on, were buying the rubies directly and, and taking them back to the main ruby market, which is in, in Bangkok. In 2017, government had a major clear out of that. And there's been some real questions over human rights abuses in that clear out. And thousands of people were moved away. And that was a huge recruitment campaign for the insurgent group. Um, in fact, they, they, they turned to violence later that year, actually, in, in October 2017. Is the illicit activity moving around in response to the fact that there's an insurgency in Cabo Delgado? A major part of the economy in Cabo Delgado for decades has been the illicit economy. The formal economy has been relatively small and it's been relatively captured by elites. So the majority of people have found ways to be involved in the illicit economy. So elephant poaching was an issue in the ivory trade. Timber trafficking has been an issue. And you know, even with that, elites are making the money. But it is something that people who are poorer and live off the land more can in some ways access. You know, they, can, they, can, they can potentially poach an elephant or be a guide and take poachers in. They can harvest a couple of hardwood trees and sell that word. For years, there was a flourishing, you know, very open bushmeat market in Pemba and and Cabo de Gata. So Mm -hmm. people could poach uh, bushmeat and bring it into Pemba and sell it. So that illicit economy was was the way that the majority of people were able to make money. What about government efforts to really address illicit activity? Have there been any major operations or efforts that have slowed the intensity of these activities? The place where there has been real success has been around ivory trafficking. And I think the success is kind of twofold. And one is that there are some very, very good people involved in law enforcement in Mozambique. And they got together and targeted ivory trafficking. And they made it made this a real focus. And so they actually arrested one of the major ivory traffickers, who was a Tanzanian individual. They arrested him in northern Mozambique. But the Mozambican government were, were very conscious that it might be difficult to actually prosecute him successfully in northern Mozambique, especially with the insurgency ongoing, etc. So they moved him to Tanzania, which I think was a very wise decision. And basically, ivory trafficking disappeared almost overnight. Now, there were a couple of other key traffickers which were taken out as well. The Chinese government did some amazing work, and they disrupted and dismantled and arrested a, um, three major Chinese traffickers who were part of one network. And then there was a Ghanaian network also operating in northern Mozambique. And the a mix of the U.S. government and the Ugandan government and one or two others broke that network. And the key guy, people were actually indicted in New York and actually taken. The Ugandans expelled them and they were taken to New York as well, to the Southern District of New York to be tried in the U.S. That actually happened last year as well. So there was this nice multinational group of multinational law enforcement agencies that worked together kind of independently, but they achieved enormous success. Mm. That was Alistair Nelson, senior analyst who coordinates the GI's Resilience Fund work in Mozambique.
That's it for this episode of Deep Dive, exploring organized crime. A special thank you to Professor Adriano Novunga, Simone Hasem, and Alistair Nelson. If you want to hear more from the Global Initiative, head over to our website, www.globalinitiative.net, where you can find reports, policy briefs, as well as other podcasts looking at organized crime. I'll be back soon to host our brand new podcast called Africa and the Global Illicit Economy. Twice a month, we'll be tackling the big issues and news regarding transnational organized crime on the African continent. Until then, this podcast was produced by Jack Megan Vickers. I'm Lindy Mtolana. Thanks for listening.